Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizing team, this is me, Siddharth Kanan, your host, welcoming you all to the final day of the Sankalp Unconvention Summit 2013. A very, very good morning to all of you. How about giving a good morning back as well? Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful. <laughs> After the delightful evening yesterday, where we celebrated, as you all know, the Vilgro Awards and the Salkamba Awards, it was really exciting and motivating for me as well, being a part of your family. So thank you so much on my behalf as well. Yesterday was very, very intense, full of great ideas and conversations. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we shall experience sharing and learning from each other. We will focus on collaboration in a very, very big way. I would like to take a moment to thank all of you for your participation and encouragement to make this event so successful. And as discussed, you can make the summit go viral ASAP. We are using a couple of Twitter handles for Sankalp Unconvention Summit 2013. You can use the hashtag SUS2013 or hashtag Sankalp while you tweet. You can also visit the Sankal Forum page on Facebook. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to call on stage the guest of honor, Mrs. Parveen Amanullah. She is the social welfare minister in Nitish Kumar-led JDU, BJP combined government in Bihar. She is a graduate from Delhi University and daughter of former Palmer parliamentarian and diplomat Syed Shahabuddin. She is perhaps the first Muslim woman minister in the state of Bihar since independence. Heading one of the most important departments, she is committed to its goals, developing a system by harnessing the positive impact of child development, integrated development scheme, state pension, and other schemes to empower the marginalized sections wherein they become capable of protecting their rights. She is also an eminent right to information activist. Ma'am, can I please call you on stage to address our lovely audience? Can we please hear it for her? <laughs> lovely to have you with us once again, ma'am. Good morning and namaskar, everybody. Recent reports of large-scale irregularities in country, such as the 2G, Commonwealth Games, coal block allocations, defense purchases, mining deals, etc., have beset our country with alarming regularity. Public confidence in government and politicians is probably at its lowest level in post-independent India. Campaigns for no criminals in politics reverberated across the country in 2004 and 2009 general elections. It was evident in the Lokpal movement of 2011 and 12 that people have become tired of corruption, of the same election rhetoric, and are hungry for a new direction. After 65 years of freedom, why have successive governments who have been voted for by the people, supposed to work for the people, and run with the money of the people, unable to secure for all its citizens enabling environment for access to food, health, education, security, and employment, it is time we took a closer look at what ails our democratic institutions and learn from the lessons of the past. Do our citizens have any feeling of empowerment and of being a part of the democratic process, or are they appro approached only for votes every few years? Or if the government fails to perform its functions, do citizens have recourse to action? Are we truly free, or have we simply replaced a system established and controlled by colonizers pre-1947 by one controlled and institutionalized by our elected representatives and bureaucrats post-1947. In Brazil in the 1990s, President Lula da Silva in initiated the now famous budget participatory budgeting exercise, a part of a number of innovative reform programs to overcome severe inequality in living standards among city dwellers in Porto Alegre. One third of the population lived in slums at the city's outskirts, lacking access to public amenities. Under this exercise, money for development became annually subject 
to prioritizing of spending by neighborhood and regional assemblies. The impact was truly path-breaking. Um, between 1989 and 1996, the number of households with access to water services in Porto Alegre rose from 80% to 98% of a uh, percentage of population served by municipal sewage system rose from 46% to 85%. Number of children enrolled in public schools doubled in the poorer neighborhoods. 30 kilometers of roads were paved annually. Transparency provided motivation to pay taxes. Revenues increased by nearly 50%. The exercise became so popular that his party won four successive terms in municipal elections in this town. Over 80 Brazilian cities are now following this model of participatory budgeting and this has spread to hundreds of Latin American cities and countries in Europe, Asia, Africa and North America. The Porto Alegre experiment shows that in India, a citizen feels completely helpless before government on an everyday basis because they have neither control over their resources nor control over their officials. Mohalla or village level pro problems are being attempted to be solved through schemes from state and central capitals. Obviously, it cannot work. The country or even the state is so diverse in its geography, history, culture, socioeconomic situation that the problems and the solution are bound to vary from place to place. Gandhi had said that democracy cannot be run by a few people sitting in big cities of Delhi, Bombay and Calcutta. I want to distribute it in seven lakh villages of India. But this never happened due to his untimely death at a crucial juncture in history. Thus, it is not surprising that today in India, governance is a mess. Details sought under right to information in many part of the, parts of the country reveals large scale siphoning of funds in government works. When people complain to authorities, they simply do not listen because we do not have a direct system of accountability to take them to task. Taking an, an example from my department, the ICDS system, in an Anganwadi, work, uh, Anganwadi system, worker who is given resources and powers to do her job may not be serving citizens in her village. Ordinarily, if this happened, they do not have any power to hold her accountable. The people in the village would not have any power to hold her accountable and remedy the situation then and there. Instead, citizens must complain to the higher authority, the CDPO, the Child Development Program Officer at the block level. Because this worker is accountable only to this officer. But if this officer does not take action on the complaint, a citizen can only complain to the CDPO's bosses and so on and so forth till it would probably reach the minister. Thus, Timely and effective action to easily discipline the worker cannot be done, but would necessitate carrying out an inquiry, reporting, passing of files up and down the already overworked hierarchy, uh, overworked hierarchy at a big cost of time and effort till final action could be taken on just one worker in one village, or again, it may not even be taken. Thus, unless the Anganwari worker is made directly accountable to the citizens in her village, things would not improve. Likewise, all local officials need to be made directly accountable to people's assemblies. In the absence of an effective delivery system, people have a lot of expectations from their MPs and MLAs. If anything goes wrong in a constituency, people rush to their MLAs or MP. But these public representatives do not have executive powers to solve day-to-day -day problems like water, electricity, roads, sewerage, etc. Their job is to participate in discussions to make good laws and raise questions in legislature about problems which affect a sizable number of people. Again, due to constraints of time, the questions by many MLAs and MPs may not be taken up in houses uh, because they are selected by lottery. And so many of the problems may not be taken up at all. Thus, there is a need to create effective, social, uh, effective local self-governing institutions at grassroots level to give control of funds, functions, and functionaries to people's assemblies at local, govern, at local level. 73rd and 74th Amendment to the Constitution provides the effective platform 
through Panchayati Raj in rural areas and municipalities in urban areas. Here people would collectively meet uh, in their gram or mohalla sabhas and take decisions which should be bounding on local bureaucracy. Although very strong state and central governments have been created to deal with issues at state and central level, local bodies have been rendered ineffective by successive governments. India has a long history of governments by discussion in which people's assemblies took decisions and that affected their lives through debate, consultation and voting. During Buddha's times, though the rulers were not elected and a king's son became the next king, the day-to-day -day decisions of governance were taken in village assemblies which were respected by the king. An example of sophisticated local level democracy in Indian history is recorded on the walls of the Sundar Varada temple in Kanchipuram district. The inscriptions document a written constitution that dealt with elections to a village assembly around 750 AD. And they talk about qualifications required <coughs> of contesting candidates, circumstances under which a candidate would be disqualified, mode of election, tenure of the elected candidates, and the right of the public to recall the elected members when they fail to discharge their duties properly. The village assembly had administrative and judicial functions and was empowered to impose and collect fines from both common criminals and errant village administrators. Public services such as testing of gold quality, management of institutes of learning and village tank maintenance were rendered, were rendered effectively by delegating the task to committees. The Rig Veda mentions states in the Vedic age which are mostly monarchies but with two democratic institutions called the Sabha and the Samiti. The Sabha is widely interpreted to be the assembly of important chieftains of the tribe, while the Samiti is a gathering of all men of the tribe convened for special occasions. These kept check of the powers of the king and were given a semi-divine status in the Rig Veda. Later, there were many assemblies, sorry, there were many republics or Mahajana Padas in ancient India which were established sometime before the 6th century BC, prior to the birth of Gautam Buddha. And Vaishali in Bihar was the world's first republic. The tiny Indian village republics flourished through the Hindu, Muslim, and Peshwa governments. They survived the breakup of dynasties and downfall of empires. The independent local government provided like the shell of a tortoise, a haven of peace where the national culture could draw in for its safety when political storms burst over the land. The kings received state revenues from the village commonwealths and generally did not interfere with their governance. Subsequently, the greed of East India Company caused gradual disintegration of these gram panchayats. The centralization of executive and judicial power into their hands deprived the village functionaries of their old age powers and, sorry, their age long powers and influence. Unfortunately, we continued with the same system after independence. Now, after 65 years, it has become apparent that our top-down, centralized approach to governance has proven to be inefficient. People's uh, power in contemporary India, uh, I would like to talk about that. Closer to home, we have the example in Hivre Bazar, a village in Ahmednagar district of Maharashtra. 20 years ago, this village was reeling under consecutive years of severe drought, rampant crime, and backwardness. People were emigrating to nearby towns. Public services were virtually non-existent. Groundwater level had alarmingly receded, causing setback in farming and cattle rearing activities. When Sri Popat Rao Pawar was elected as the village headman, he decided firstly that he would only heed and implement what people decided in the Gram Sabhas. Secondly, he decided that all village level government functionaries would be directly answerable to his people in this village assembly. The rest is history. The village is now an example of amazing growth and development where citizens take pride in the village. Per capita income of people has improved from Rs. 842 in 1989 to Rs. 28,000 today, only with transparency, accountability and people's participation. Today we can hardly speak of growth, especially in a landlocked state such as Bihar, 
devoid of natural resources, beleaguered with natural calamities, deep caste divisions, poverty, illiteracy, lingering corruption. It is a huge challenge to provide for and ensure that education, basic health care, infrastructure, schemes for poverty alleviation and benefits of welfare programs reach grassroots level. This cannot be done without real devolution of power to bring permanent transformation in the lives of people at the bottom of the pyramid. It was with a deep and abiding faith in Swaraj and with a previous experience of unfortunate runs in with democracy and politocracy in the course of my work as right to information and election watch activist I joined the Department of Social Welfare in November 2010 as a minister in NDA 2. Integrated Child Development Scheme, or ICDS, is a flagship program of my department aiming at removing malnutrition. Through it, we have reached in nearly every ward in urban centers of Bihar and every village in rural Bihar through 91,677 centers providing cooked food or rations to a total of one crore children between six months to six years, adolescent girls and pregnant and lactating women at an annual expenditure of 1300 crore rupees. I was dismayed when my department officials, not without some pride, had stories to tell about large scale pilferage of funds by Anganwadi workers and mismanagement by field staff. Added to this, there was hardly any system of monitoring here in comparison to the large expenditure. It was widely believed that this system could never be corrected. An accountant general inspection report of 2007 described it as being only 27% functional. We introduced Swaraj in ICDS with approval of Honorable Chief Minister of Bihar, who first said that idea of empowering people was too idealistic, but agreed that this could be used as a pilot project to eventually devolve power to the people in other areas of governance as well. Thus, social audit of an Anganwadi center through empowered local citizens was introduced. Through this, people can now do daily monitoring of activities of Anganwadi centers, such as proper selection of beneficiaries, ensuring timely opening and closing of centers, attendance of children and workers, quantity and quality of food, distribution of rations, which takes place once a month, and also quality of construction of the Anganwadi centers. Citizens can now call a meeting or Aam Sabha by themselves, elect a five member audit and vigilance committee by general consen consensus, by their own consensus, and execute to, to execute their decisions. The Aam Sabha can, as and when required, summon the Anganwadi workers, call for Anganwadi documents and accounts, if the workers are found negligent in performance of, the of their duties, or if any irregularities are found, the general body of the villagers can issue a warning to her and ask her to improve her functioning. If this does not work, people can take a decision to impose penalty on her or even recommend disciplinary, ac disciplinary action, including removal from work. People have the recourse to elect a new committee every year if need be. Thus, all important ingredients to make self-governance happen and key to improving local governance, giving control of funds, functions, and functionaries was given to People's Assembly. I think this might be the first um, government uh, 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 department in the whole country who has ever done this. Administrative reforms have proved to be another important factor in improving governance in my department. I insisted that we introduce a regular system of surprise inspections by officers and myself. In the past two years, about 1,601 centers have been inspected and nearly 336 inspection programs, in uh, nearly 336 inspection programs, and on the basis of such inf inspections, 982 workers have been removed and other disciplinary actions have been taken on hundreds of others. Apart from this, around 86 uh, child development program officers who are gazetted officers have been suspended in the last two years, and three of them have been dismissed from service. Other punishments are being given to 50 other child development prog program officers. 
Departmental proceedings are going on on 63 of them. Another step we took was that we revisited and restructured existing rules and regulations, prepared new inspection formats for different levels of staff and standard operating procedures for levying punishments depending on quantum of irregularities. I personally devised a reporting system for officers to get full information at state level of their inspections, their recommendations and action taken. New formats were created in this regard for panchayat, block and district level staff and made provisions for online reporting from block to state level so that punishments levied were realized and proper records were maintained. Stick, strict adherence to purchase process has been levied to eliminate any kind of irregularities from taking place. Any defalcation was reported to competent authority for taking necessary action. Visible changes can now be seen through regular opening and functioning of centers and improvement in the quality and quantity of food being prepared. In an inquiry conducted in January 2012, it was found that about 85% of centers were functional. In a rapid survey in June 2012 by an NGO, it was reported that 96% of Anganwadi centers were opening and they were functional. Bihar government has envisaged inclusive growth and is imp implementing this for all round development. Women's empowerment is a very important agenda for us. It is evident in many schemes being carried out for girls and women to empower them, make them self-reliant. Government has given 50% reservation to women in municipal and panchayat seats and 35% reservation in police recruitments in the state. Human development indices are already showing sure but slow but sure improvement. In conclusion, I would like to say that while I'm convinced, and I'm sure as innovators you will agree, that Swaraj is a, in, an important factor to make the task of development easier. We need more people to understand and demand Swaraj or proper implementation of 73rd and 74th amendments to the Constitution. A village like Hebre Bazaar was like any other village in this country, but it solved seemingly unsolvable problems. Most importantly, it facilitated quality of education for its children, harnessing of water and planting and conservation of forest to eliminate drought, created environment for people to build thriving livelihoods and live in peaceful and harmonious coexistence. While the rest of the country failed, this little village has succeeded. Thank you very much for giving me patient hearing. Thank you very much uh, to Sankalp Unconvention Summit for inviting me and allowing me to uh, express myself. Long live Swaraj, long live the Indian Republic. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, ma'am, for bringing about transformational changes and giving a perspective on that. I request you to please remain on stage. Please. Thank you, ma'am. Now can I call the organizers to present Mrs. Amanullah a token of our gratitude for your presence today. Thank you so much, ma'am. Indeed, an honor to have you with us. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's now move to the first plenary session of the day. Our opening plenary is titled, South-South Collaboration in Impact Investing, Relevance of India's Experience. The moderator for the session is Mr. Patrick Follis. Patrick is the India business editor of The Economist and is based in Mumbai. The panelists for this session are Mr. Anil Sinha, Regional Head, South Asia Advisory Services, IFC. Mr. Florian Arnett, Senior Project Manager, KFW. Ms. Nisha Dutt, Director, Consulting Services, Intellicap. Ms. Kono Satoko, Founder and Director, Arun, LLC. Mr. Vikas Nath, Associate Director, Future UN Development Systems. We'd also like to acknowledge the presence of a few experts in the audience. Mr. Fifa Saeed, who's a Senior Advisor, Culture and Development at USAID. Mr. David Munir Napti, who is the CEO of All City in Lebanon, and Mr. George Kalaf, who heads the Middle East and North Africa work at Senegos. Now,
May I please call all the panelists and the moderator to join us on stage. Can we please hear it for them, please? Wonderful, way to go. It's 11 years since the, the term brick was invented, um, and that term has uh, come to be synonymous, really, um, with South-South economic trade and political relations, and in a way it's become a, a simplified way of talking about the, the rise of the emerging world um, in, in the global economy. But the problem with the world of um, finance and economics is it tends to be pretty schizophrenic and change its mind. And I think in the last few years, um, the whole idea of BRICS has uh, come under some criticism uh, and uh, by implication, the whole idea of South-South trade. Um, for a start, the man who coined the phrase BRIC has uh, recently retired uh, as uh, the head of global economics at Goldman Sachs, a guy called Jim, Jim O'Neill. And the new pretender to the throne, a guy called Ruchia Sharma at uh, Morgan Stanley, has just written a book which says um, South-South uh, similarities are scant and that most uh, big emerging economies have little um, in common. That's also borne out a little bit by recent economic performance. Um, if you look at the gap between the best um, emerging economies and the worst, it's got very big. Brazil right now is growing at 1%, China is growing at 7 to 8%, uh, and countries like India are in the middle struggling. But there doesn't seem to be very much consistency. Um, I was struck by um, the idea of BRICS being under threat by the uh, recent summit uh, in Durban in South Africa, and the most striking moment from that was not uh, declarations of brotherhood, of fraternity, uh, of friendship. Instead, it was that the security guards uh, with Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, ended up getting in a fight uh, at the entrance to the hotel with the, the convention center security guards. Uh, and it turned out that he had tried to take, uh, they had tried to take the briefcase with the nuclear bomb codes and put them through the x-ray machine. Uh, naturally, the Russians weren't pleased. Now, I'm glad to say we haven't had any fights so far at this convention center, but it is our job um, to try and talk a little bit uh, about whether we do have anything in common um, or whether, uh, in fact, the differences are bigger than the similarities. Um, and I'd like to start, first of all, by just briefly setting the stage. Um, you know, what is the relative significance of different regions in terms of impact investing? Um, the most recent figures I, um, I have from um, JP Morgan uh, show that of a total sum invested in impact investing of about $4 billion in 2011, about half uh, was in, in emerging economies. And within that, um, you had Africa at 7% of the global total, uh, Asia at 6% of the global total, and Latin America at just over 10%. So the impression is that the markets are a fairly similar size. However, rather than rely on statistics from investment banks, which are usually unreliable, um, we fortunately have someone who represents um, a big global uh, enterprise involved in many markets in the form of Anil um, from IFC. And I've asked him briefly to give an overview of uh, his uh, organization's activities and a sense of which markets are, are most important. Oh, thank you, uh, Patrick, and uh, oh, sorry, you're wide up. Um, so, so thanks, Patrick, and thank you to the organizers for for inviting <coughs> me here on behalf of IFC, International Finance Corporation, which, uh, as you may know, is the private sector arm of the World Bank. We make investments directly with the private sector in developing countries, and we also provide advice to governments as well as to to companies. 
inclusive business models, social enterprises is, is a big focus for us, as is South-South. Uh, since 2005, uh, we've made a total of about $7 billion in impact investment in, in various parts of the world. Our portfolio is divided mainly uh, between Latin America and South Asia, one third, one third, and, and the other countries coming up with the, with the balance one third. It is a profitable portfolio, but clearly different characteristics. Uh, there are models that are going across from India to Africa um, because of traditional uh, similarities in development. Uh, there is, a, I think, a, a transfer that's, that's happening, but there isn't a robust platform that enables this to happen. Examples of Indian companies going across are, uh, for example, Fino, the biometric uh, financial inclusion project, uh, which has done very well for, uh, in terms of impact, nearly 50 million customers now in <coughs> India. Um, and what's particularly interesting is the government is using Fino to deliver financial services like NREGA. So this play between private sector and government is a good, interesting interplay, which is now moving across to Africa. Um, Jane Irrigation, uh, another example, agribusiness going across to East Africa. Husk Power, smaller company out of Bihar, uh, just won an award in Africa. But should entrepreneurs go across or should models go across? Mm -hmm and should knowledge go across is another issue. Um, and what platforms do we need? Uh, and I can point on that as, as we go across. The other aspect is to make transfer happen, you also need a financial infrastructure in that other uh, recipient country. Um, you can provide equity capital, but you need the local banks to also provide debt equity. So for example, the work we're doing with Exim Bank uh, is, is interesting where the, the Indian government has mandated Exim Bank to actually play the South-South role, as you know, where we've given finance to Exim Bank to lend to African banks to hold the debt side uh, of this transfer of, of knowledge and, and investment. Um, Latin America clearly emerging, and the numbers also of J.B. Morgan support that, as a big player in terms of impact investment. Um, different models to India, I would say. Even the agribusiness sector is, is much different, so you need a different model play there. But what is interesting in both India as well as in Latin America, three areas are common. One is scale. India offers that huge scale of development challenges. Secondly, entrepreneurial ability. India has the largest entrepreneurial uh, uh, sector, I would say, globally. And third is the technological base. How do you combine scale, entrepreneurship, and technology uh, to make uh, impact using the private sector and then transfer this south-south. So Patrick, I think just stop there and I'm happy to come back. And, and which, uh, I mean, it sounds like of your portfolio, it's roughly equally split between um, um, uh, the, the, the regions. Which bit's been growing fast? I mean, if you, if you look historically, how have things changed in terms of the weights of um, your portfolio and which, which regions have got bigger, relatively speaking? Sure, in terms of large companies driving down, Latin America is expanding very rapidly. In terms of smaller companies going up and in terms of much more innovative practices and models, it, it certainly is India. But has the size of Latin America gone from nothing to a lot? I mean, yes. or has the proportions remained similar? I think the proportions have remained similar. I would say if I was to forecast in the next three years, South Asia would far exceed Latin America. Okay. Um, before we move on to some specifics, I just want to stick on, on this, this philosophical issue of, of whether it makes sense for us to talk about um, uh, impact investing in a global sense at all. And I, um, I thought we'd, we'd ask Florian, who works for um, uh, a very large German um, development bank, um, how his organization is beginning to think about this. Um, you, you have um, experience in Africa and are currently focused on Asia. But is it the case that your organization is beginning to think about impact investing as a coherent portfolio across the globe, or does it remain stuck in silos? What, what's your experience? How do you think things will change? Well, as we are just uh, starting to explore this new field of activities, of course, we would first see uh, how uh, the lessons learned are uh, before extending it also to other regions. So what we have done as a development bank is, of course, to start with Asia as um, one piloting region. And I think we are well suited because um, we bring together the risk orientation of the bank um, 
with a social problem solving orientation of the development agency. And um, this is exactly the field where also this entrepreneurship uh, subject is set in. So what we were trying is first to explore investing into uh, a couple of um, direct uh, investment funds into uh, impact ventures. And now we are trying to scale up and uh, using the experience that is available in India um, to reach out to the Asian region as a whole. So we would like to set up a regional fund um, managed by an Indian fund manager who uses his experience to also reach out um, and transfer the lessons learned to other uh, Asian countries. And as we know that um, not only the money matters in this field because capital is available, especially equity for the lower hanging fruits is abundant. We think that um, development of ecosystem is um, equally important or even more important as a lot of um, investors are chasing the same animals and it makes sense to, um, to further develop the ecosystem. So we are also trying to set up a regional DA facility jointly with ADB um, to improve um, policy advocacy, but also, of course, um, all the service providers, incubators, etc., to strengthen um, their abilities and also to transfer the knowledge in the context of uh, regional conferences or um, also locally organized conferences such as Sankalp in Indonesia, Sankalp in Bangladesh, for instance, that could help to build an awareness and uh, to start also um, uh, the, the development of the market for social entrepreneurs and impact investors in these markets. And if, if you were to predict your organization in 10 years' time, do you think that you, know, you, you will be sitting in a big room and there'll be people who do Asia, people who do Africa, people who do um, uh, Latin America, sharing ideas, comparing their investments? Well, I would love to, but I must say it's a bit early to say this because, uh, of course, there has not that's, yet that's been... That's how a, a conventional investor would work. Yeah, but right. in addition, I mean, there has not yet been a successful exit history. I mean, a few exits have been done by um, investment funds, but still we lack a lot of experience. So we are just starting to learn, to explore, and if it's working, we might also convince our colleagues of the other regional departments within KFW, and of course also German government, etc., to also reach out globally or to other regions. But this is too early and uh, we are learning. But we, the whole bank, I think, is paying a lot of attention to this new subject. It's innovative, it's attractive, but um, the results must also be there. Okay, so it seems the direction of travel is, is relatively clear, but um, how long it takes to get there um, is, is less clear. I'd, um, I'd like to move on to, to something um, you touched on, but um, among uh, the regions, of course, an interesting question is the pecking order. Who is most advanced? Who is least advanced? Um, and um, in particular, I think we'd all be interested to know where India stands uh, relative to other regions. Obviously, has a, a rich history, and many people in India feel it's a leader in this field. Um, Nisha, I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about where you think India sits relative to Africa, Latin America. Patrick, I think that um, India is probably the most evolved ecosystem in the sense of impact investing. And I say that not just because I'm an Indian, but I think uh, if you think about an eco ecosystem and the elements that go into making it successful, so first of all, uh, look at the investor landscape. We have right from you know high net worth individuals to angel investors to VCs to PE. So we have the whole gamut of investors. We have intermediaries. Um, we have intermediaries. Uh, you know, all the investment banking uh, infrastructure is already quite evolved in India to help facilitate deals. We have uh, infrastructures such as Sankal Forum and a lot of incubators like Wellgrow uh, that are help that help create this pipeline of investment ready enterprises. Um, we also have advisory services uh, that can you know advise enterprises and make them investment ready. So I think in the sense that we do have a, a full infrastructure. And one of the most interesting things to me is that uh, when we were in debates yesterday, we heard a lot about uh, measurement of impact. And I think uh, only an evolved impact investing ecosystem can even get to a conversation where we are talking about the measurement of it. So that itself is an indicator to me that you know we are quite evolved. 
And the, the last point I'll make is that it's around self-regulation. Um, there are impact investors today, they are talking about, you know, regulating themselves to respond better to the challenges. So, in a sense, I would say that we are quite evolved. I would not like to comment on who's worse, but I think uh, India is You can comment ahead. on who's best, which... Well, <laughs> India, for sure. Almost the same thing. Yes. Um, and, and I mean, one thing that strikes me about India is I would guess there's probably more of a positive attitude towards business here generally, Absolutely. and the idea that someone can make money and do good do is good. Yes, definitely. accepted. I, Indians, um, it's taken us a while. I won't say that it was always the case, but I think uh, we are at a point where we embrace the for-profit culture much more, uh, much more than maybe some other countries in Southeast Asia or even in Africa. So I think that uh, itself generates a lot of entrepreneurial energy and activity. So that itself has helped us uh, move this journey, you know, come along in this journey. So. Kono, you, you um, look at a different bit of Asia. Um, do, do you sit there obsessing about the giant India? Does it, does it loom large or um, do, do you feel your local markets have a rhythm of their own? Um, thank you. Satoko. Um, um, yeah, um, we run... The social investment fund called Arun. Um, we invest into the social enterprises in Southeast Asia. So this is really new environment to, to me, to, to us, and I have been fascinating to, to be in this ecosystem and to be with you all. Um, so in the degree or the massive scale, as um, he pointed out, it's quite different, I would say. But uh, it doesn't mean that uh, there is not none there in Southeast Asia. And we can kind of witness that, that there are entrepreneurial spirit and entrepreneurs are there. In fact, Arun has studied in 2009 because of the social entrepreneurs' strong determination and uh, strong commitment moves us, moves uh, Japanese investors to jump into this field. The social investment in Japan is quite new, a new concept, so there is nobody doing uh, investment towards the developing countries. So we are the first one to start this initiative why? Because of the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So we see clearly the development of entrepreneur. But maybe the differences is um, ecosystem or the, the, uh, the environment. Another reason that uh, um, social enterprises coming up in Southeast Asia is maybe their economy is taking off and their donor-driven economy or the heavily depending on to the donor um, support will be changing, shifting, but utilizing the, the, the base that cultivated by the donor support, they would like to do something new, um, something useful to the society. Often in, in Japan also, people may think that um, uh, Southeast Asia, we were um, particularly like Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, where we work, the, the, the least developed economy, maybe the commercial business is more important than social enterprise maybe later. But that's not true. In fact, the entrepreneur or the people themselves, not the foreigner, but themselves started to naturally um, the enterprises and business with both social focus and financial uh, um, sustainability. So I think there is a clear indication that the, the, the seed and the, the, um, the ground uh, start to, to be up. But what, for example, when you go and speak to your ultimate investors in Japan, mm. do, do they sort of go, well, what, a, what about India? What are they doing in India? Shouldn't you be doing that? I mean, does India, clearly we're in India, so most people here think India um, um, is, is you know, very important. I wonder whether if you're in Japan, India comes up at all. What's yeah, your sense? For sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we have this China and India, and we have this business going on, and uh, the importance of India is huge. But, but, but think, in, in, in this field specific? Yeah, but, but then, in general concept of the importance of India doesn't necessarily include this, this uh, sphere of social enterprise or impact investment. So I think this, there are lots to, to do to communicate and to, to dialogue between the rest of the Asia and India. Okay. Um, sticking on the subject of India, I, I know um, 
uh, uh, Vikas, you have um, um, some particular thoughts on, on something different about India, which is also the role of the government um, in promoting um, social enterprise and impact investing. And I wonder if you could just touch on, on that briefly. It seems to be an important difference about sure. India. Sure. I think the India's contribution is zero. In 594 AD, Aryabhatta gave the number zero to the world economy. And since then, there has been no stopping back because that's what the impact is happening. Coming a little bit forward, 1894, India gave Gandhi to the world, the best impact we could have in the whole world. Nonviolence, civil disobedience, that was exported to the whole world. Coming even forward, 1947, India's independence. We got independence, we got in touch with freedom struggles in other countries. We supported independence in Ghana, Namibia, Kenya, Uganda. How can you beat an impact on that? It's an impact. Are we making a difference? That's what Sankalp is for. And we are making a difference using this innovative models of uh, development. Coming even forward, I mean, we keep hearing about aid coming from other countries to India. 1964, India formed the Inter Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation. Would you believe that, that ITEC has given development cooperation to 168 countries in the world? It has given training. It has given deputation support. It has given humanitarian aid. It has supported in projects. Every year, 5,000 students from Africa, Latin America come fully funded by the government to come into the India so that we can give the training, impact assessment, everything goes back to, to, different, world, to different world. Coming even forward, you know, the latest models, you know, uh, India believes in the vision. Julius Nerere, the first president of Tanzania, he said, if countries can't share their wealth, which has been the case with the developed countries, let's share our poverty. And India has been on the forefront of sharing poverty-based solutions. How India can come out of poverty. It has given aid, uh, not even aid, it has given expertise to Ethiopia to set up agriculture exchange, commodities exchange. They are doing very well. They have raised $5 million for agro enterprises in Ethiopia. Both of them are poor countries. We all figure out, as someone said, 150th in the Human Development Index. But that has not stopped us from giving the kind of cooperation we wanted to give to other countries. Infrastructure lending. You know, uh, lots of World Bank agencies said, okay, we can't give investment in a particular thing. India has stepped in. Djibouti, Ethiopia Railway invested $300 million coming from the Indian government. Impact, amazing. Moving on even further, education. The first Indian African ag agriculture, uh, Indian African virtual university, Pan-African network, these are, again, the Indian models of cooperation, Indian models of investment, you know, where if you look at some of the other models, China believes in, for example, state-sponsored commercial interest, whereas Indian model has always been on government ties, very government, close government ties with the southern countries. Coming even forward, I mean, as recent as last five years, ten years, you know, we keep hearing about impacts from other places saying, we have done so much of health issues in Africa, we have solved a lot of challenges there. But talk about India. We did compulsory licensing. The HIV AIDS drug, which was manufactured by the Western countries, they were sold at 1.5 lakh, lakhs rupees per month. That was the cost. India stepped in, ran back C, CIPLA. They changed the drugs from 1.5 lakhs that's per month to 8,000 rupees per month. The impact is that South Africa, all the HIV AIDS drugs, they're all coming from India. So this is the uniqueness of Indian model of impact investment. We don't believe that we have all the money. We, we don't have the money. We have the expertise. We have the solutions which can, you know, alleviate poverty and make an impact. Um, and, and uh, well, it'd be interesting if we had someone um, from China here on the panel, I'm sure we could have a fierce competition between um, <laughs> who is, who is uh, influencing Africa the most. But um, let, let's turn to some specifics. Um, it strikes me from the outside, one of the, the big problems of, of this um, industry, if that's the right word, is um, there's lots of commitment to spend money, but it's actually pretty difficult to do it on the ground. And there's a difference between the dry powder the industry has, the commitments uh, people would like to make, and how much um, they're actually able to invest. So I'd like to put a question to the panel, and anyone can, anyone can pick up who feels like it, but is there a particular difference uh, between how easy it is to put money to work to find investment opportunities uh, in Latin America, Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, or, or, or India? I mean, is, is that a distinctive difference between the regions? 
I think in terms of uh, putting money out, it's not that difficult, honestly. It's getting money back. <laughs> that's slightly more difficult. <laughs> and uh, creating that impact that's sustainable. Uh, I think there's too much talk about you know, more funds, more funds getting out there. Great. I mean, the IFC does $20 billion a year uh, globally in private sector investment if we do it profitably. But the biggest uh, challenge is, is these kind of enterprises and can we get that market working? I think we haven't seen the end of that market making mechanism as yet. So what can we do to get the exits out, to get the impact more and then develop it further? I think that's the challenge I, I would say going forward. And the other thing is the knowledge part of it. But how do the regions compare? I mean, I would, I would guess, for example, it's harder to exit a business in Africa than in India. Slightly harder, not, not that much more, more, uh, more, more difficult because I think this exit mechanisms don't exist even in India to the extent that they should, uh, for example. Look at any of these mature funds. Which of these mature funds has really <coughs> made any substantial exit? I mean, we just need to talk to our uh, uh, chairman of this entire group, uh, Vineet, to talk about that. I think that remains a challenge for, for the entire ecosystem to work. Honestly, but to get money out, IFC does a billion dollars in India. We could double it. We could without a problem right now. Okay, uh, could you double it in Africa or in Latin America? We, we 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 could, but could we do it staying in this space and keeping the development focus? Uh, that's another issue. So I would say not in terms of volume. We need to get narrower and more precise at the base of the pyramid impact that we want to generate and do that sustainably. Okay. Anyone else? What, what, how, how do the regions compare in terms of ease of investing and, as, as you pointed out, exit? Well, um, we have found out that um, the entrepreneurial potential varies also with the geographies. I mean, here in India, there are many entrepreneurs who really know how to combine innovative ideas, technology, with entrepreneurial skills. In other regions, you find a lot of uh, socially minded entrepreneurs that are really grant dependent and that, nunca, uh, that never get to this level um, of um, really being investment ready. So um, this is a huge difference, I think. And there you must also admit that not every entrepreneur that claims to be a social entrepreneur is also a good businessman. I mean, um, you will need to find the right talents and this is one of the challenges. Um, and only if you find the right talents and maybe have good partnerships in place, then you also can succeed in growing such businesses and scaling them. I agree on the partnership point though because um, I always think that uh, when you talk about impact investing, uh, for all the press it gets, uh, very often the entrepreneurs that end up getting the money, um, they, you know, impact investing money itself cannot get them to what I call as escape velocity very often. And for that you need other systems to come in place, right? So uh, for an entrepreneurial ecosystem to really take off and thrive, you do need, you know, the large corporates to then make entry into that space. You need those partnerships, you need those effective mechanisms, other market mechanisms now need to start building on the impact investing ecosystem itself. So I think in that sense, again, India has benefited a bit because we have a very large and thriving SME uh, culture. We have, a, we have some of the biggest, largest corporates that are in India. Um, so I think in that sense, again, we have benefited a bit and um, that's why maybe um, the other regions are lacking a little bit, not just in impact investing, but I think how do you take it to the next stage then, right? So. And, and what's been your experience in Cambodia? Again, I would imagine it's relatively more difficult to find investment opportunities there. Yeah, people say so. And uh, I think I kind of echo what uh, Nisha and others said, that uh, the business environment is still yet to be developed. Uh, the market has just opened and only one company in the market. And so, so in a commercial business setting, it's still try to build up. And the social entrepreneur or social enterprises just jump into in that immature, I would say, the, the economy, private economy. But uh, I think the importance of those social enterprises is that uh, those, th when the economy trying to, or market trying to develop, often if you are in hurry, then you tend to ignore the people. Um, in the grassroots or the vulnerable people. So the, the social entrepreneur or enterprises coming in to 
in the development stage of the economy and trying to not to mitigate the, the risks but rather to create the, the space, the alternative way to develop. So I think it's the right time but then it's more difficult to do it together. I think people do businesses with business, you know, in an environment which is um, business friendly. Uh, people don't specifically go looking for impact investments. They look sure. at the whole ecosystem saying that, okay, you know, India is overall a growing economy, overall healthy, there is good, you know, business architecture here. So I think those are the fundamental blocks that people, people, I don't think investors specifically go saying that, oh, India's, you know, larger economy is not so good, but that in impact in, uh, investing is thriving. That doesn't really happen, ever. So but I think there is a larger picture at play, which I sort of, you know, agree with Vikas on that. No, I actually, sorry. Uh, I actually think that it's a very narrow question and it's a little bit short-sighted that there is an investment and you have to exit, you know. I mean, there are lots of investments. Uh, it's a long-term partnership. I mean, the moment you go as a business model, that means you're talking about a very specific thing. You're selling a soap, you're going to produce it until you get a return and then you, you know, you're happy with the sustainability of the enterprise. But I think governments and the worlds function a little bit differently. You know, that you have to go beyond the immediate thing, you know, when the markets develop, everyone benefits. You know, I mean, when, when people are educated, you invest in countries, the markets comes back to your products. You know, I mean, there are the much more developed markets. And I think exiting too soon or thinking about exit while you're talking about long-term partnership, that should be the fundamental goal. I mean, that should actually drive the whole economy. I mean, whether it comes from the capital, comes from the private sector or from the governments or from the philanthropy. I think we need to rethink about what, what are the parameters of success and based on that, what is the exit strategy? So you might find that the parameters of success does not call for the exit strategy as we think about it. Okay. Um, just briefly again, I'd like, uh, looking at, at comparisons, I mean, does the, the areas which are most exciting, um, do they vary? I mean, for example, is renewable energy a bigger deal in India than it might be in Africa? Is irrigation a bigger deal in Latin America than it might be in Asia? What are the big differences between the sectoral um, base of activity? And if so, what are they? So IFC's global portfolio is, is uh, fairly evenly divided between what we call manufacturing and agribusiness, financial sector, and infrastructure. For us, infrastructure includes renewables. Uh, clearly, in India, uh, the renewable space is perhaps the most innovative that we've seen going forward. And the nexus between uh, renewable solar and agribusiness, so the solar pumps that are coming through, those have done well and they're going now. Gen irrigation is taking this idea across there. Uh, I would say, in terms of financial sector um, and uh, PPPs, I think we just uh, coming off the ground in terms of uh, India doing PPPs. We've done some innovative stuff now. Um, Gandhinagar rooftop solar, for example. But the entire city of Gandhinagar will have rooftop solar on a PPP mode. We set up the transaction, private sector invested. Those are few and far between. And I think that's an area where uh, other countries are, are, are more, more ahead. Agribusiness, uh, again, it's, it depends. Um, the agribusiness sector, as you know, is structured differently in Latin America with large corporates, large re estates. So the reach is much easier. The challenge in India is to make the small farmer more profitable, that one hectare small holder more profitable. So you need different business models to do that. And I think the cultural aspect really has to be taken into account also. But I would say India, in terms of renewables, by, and f by far. Uh, financial inclusion, fantastic uh, achievements happening here uh, going forward. But Africa, m has a lot to offer also to other uh, to other regions, for example. Right. Um, let, let's turn to politics um, and regulation. Um, India had this experience a few years ago with microfinance that um, I think in many ways was quite shocking. There was a, a big political backlash. It's, it's had a big impact on the industry. Um, and it's a reminder that even in a country which, um, broadly speaking, is known for um, being political, politically stable, um, you know, bad things can happen. Um, and I suppose one lesson is also the, the importance of um, impact investors sort of clubbing together and making sure they have a collective voice. So I, I wonder if, if, again, I could ask the panel to talk a little bit about the political context and how it varies from country to country, how, how one thinks about that. Mm -hmm. Anyone like to pick up? 
I think um, in Southeast Asia, the 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 government or the situation is quite diverse. So you cannot say one word for for Southeast Asia. For example, like in Cambodia, the government is very open and welcoming the investment coming in and trying to develop the entrepreneurs. So that's the climate is quite favorable for the investors. So commercial investors start coming into and uh, social investors also coming into. Myanmar just opened up, but then again, the, the government are really trying to welcome the investment. The regulatory uh, system is yet to be developed and still uh, changing. So for investors, maybe, um, particularly for commercial investors, they are wait and see um, position, but then it, it will be coming up. While some of the country like uh, Vietnam and Laos, some, some um, government are really farm and uh, have a good system. And sometimes regulatory uh, situation is too strict and uh, difficult to coming into. But, but again, uh, it depends on the way that you try to come in. Which, which country is easiest to operate in, do you think? Cambodia. <laughs> well, just, just because right. we operate there. And, but I think it's, it really uh, changes and uh, maybe, I, I'm not so familiar with Indonesia and Malaysia, but maybe... Um, and and, and mm. you, have you visited Burma in order to, for, for business as it were? What, what kind of experience did you have there? Uh, you know, it's a country that's literally just opened up. Uh, I was in Cambodia in 1995, and that was the time just right after the election, 1993. So that was it, and they tried to be independent, in that sense, to be entrepreneurial and to build up their society. So I think then it will be question to the impact investor ourselves, what kind of motive and what kind of investment that we will go into. It could be harmful too. I also think the countries are waking up. You know, for the last 70 years, you know, the countries in Africa, Latin America, they have been bombarded by the aid world. You know, largely from the developed countries, take aid, you know, you need our assistance. It's a white man's burden, William Easterly. But I think countries have realized that aid is basically a tool for colonization, subordination, and they're realizing that soon and soon, you know, I'm giving that example. For example, let's take the case of Zambia. You know, IMF, World Bank said, look, you know, you need to pay the debts, you know, privatize your copper mines. So Zambia, being an aid-dependent country, didn't know what to do, so they ended up privatizing their copper mines. The copper prices rise up, and the government of Zambia basically is now, that doesn't get any revenue from the copper mines there. So I think the world is waking up. They realize that we don't want aid. You know, business transactions you can negotiate. Whereas aid is a very asymmetrical thing. There is a donor, people coming in Burma. India and Burma have had a long relationship, but never as a donor and a recipient. So there's a difference between how countries are waking up in terms of how they are looking at regulations. So far, regulations have been oriented towards the aid world, you know, having 20 donors visiting a country and the regulations are saying that you won't have, you know, people's donors say, good governance, rule of law, good institutions. But come on, these are the outcomes of development. These cannot be the prerequisites of development. So what is happening now is that countries are realizing that, look, there are countries like India, China, Indonesia, they are waking up without the use of aid. In spite of aid, they are rising up. So there is a turmoil between the countries. They are changing their ecosystem in the country on how to negotiate better with the partners so that they can also get benefit from the investments coming in. So that it's not just the case of countries coming in, taking up their natural resources and going out. You might counter, like China is going to Africa, is it not countering the same kind of resources? But when China goes to Africa, it says, yes, we want your oil, we want your natural resources. But it says it's as a business deal. It's a negotiable deal. You can negotiate with China and say, these are the terms we agree, and these are the terms we do not agree. So I think there is a fundamental difference on how the countries are waking up to these new business regulations. And entrepreneurship will come. I mean, it's a question of time. We are the youngest generations in terms of Africa, the highest population of the young people and they have their own aspirations. So they will make pressure felt to the rest of the world, and I think the rest of the world will have to ad adapt to the aspirations of the South, which is coming up. It's a very good point. And, and 
Um, Florian, in terms of how you think about the reception you get in, in different regions, I mean, does, does political regulatory risk figure, figure highly? Well, um, while we are looking also at policy advocacy, it will only be a, a small role in this program we are currently preparing. Um, the main focus would be on having a self-regulation in place also of the investors, so to facilitate a dialogue, to have a platform in place where they can really exchange their ideas and where principles and standards can be set also um, which, to which the, the stakeholders feel adhered to. So this is what we try to do uh, as our approach. But do you, do, I mean, okay, you're looking at Asia. Are there some countries where you go, hmm, a bit worried, don't want to put money there? No, of or, course. I mean, but this, this question... Well, what tell, us, tell us more, because this is at the, this is at the crux of whether the issue. Good, whether good governance comes first or economic development, I think it's a, a difficult question, because uh, both, of course, uh, should come uh, more or less together. I mean, you can't really say what, what must be first. The European Union had the highest corruption rate until, you know, they formed a development. You know, UK had a high corruption rate. So once people develop, they realize what they want and they get their priorities right. You know, asking us to say human rights, good governance. I think we'll, we'll manage on our own very well once we economically develop and, and we will set the rules for okay, what sure. we have. I don't think anyone's really disputing that, but I, I think, I mean, the, but the issue is, is more, for, you know, for, for people in the audience interested um, in, in where, you know, which countries are sort of easier to work in essentially than others. Um, I, I, you know, do, do, you, do you work with a sort of hierarchy in your mind that, you know, X country is, more receptive, easier to work in, and why country is probably not. How does it work, Florian? You're, you're sitting there with money to allocate, so this must go through your mind. Um, but, one, but one thing is, of course, uh, how the regulation looks li uh, like on paper, and the other one is how it is implemented. And this is a, a big difference in most of the countries. So yeah, maybe you just need to look at the uh, indicators of uh, um, for uh, entrepreneurial activities in those countries, then you can see, okay, do they have right. a good regulatory regime in place that is also implemented or no? So, so the vibrancy of the entrepreneurial scene, if you like, is a sort of proxy for how easy it is, is to operate. And I guess, on, to be fair on that basis, India would, would no doubt score very well. Um, we're fortunate to have someone in the audience who um, is actually uh, uh, engaged in a sort of South, South project. Um, and um, uh, I, I'd like to ask her just to speak for a few minutes to um, uh, give us uh, her observations on, on you know, uh, differences and similarities. Uh, Afifa Saeed, who is a, a senior advisor with um, USAID. Uh, Afifa, I think you're, you're here. You may need a microphone. Thank you. Is this on? That's working, yeah. Okay. Um, I think I'll probably just pick up a little bit on some of the points made about government especially, because I'm coming from the perspective also of policy. I'm at U.S. Agency for International Development based in Washington, D.C. And I think one of the things that's interesting from a development perspective is we're really looking at what, what you pointed out, which is that the countries and the regions are rising up and they're making these uh, drastic changes. And it's an exciting time because on the development side as well, these conversations are taking place. And I think you know, what I want to start by saying is um, policymakers and development practitioners are human too. And we've also got a lot of the gamut of discussions going on. So I, and I think what we heard from the Madame Minister this morning was these conversations about innovation and impact investment that's happening internally is a large conversation. It's a very varied conversation. And I don't want us to ever think that it's you know, either black or white or very clear cut. And some of the issues with policy that we're dealing with is, from a USAID perspective, for example, from Washington, we have something called USAID Forward. And that has become a movement within our agency to look at, for example, more in-country capacity building. What can we do rather than importing and exporting out? What's within the country that's already happening that we can build upon? The other thing is more of a strategic government to government relationship. So as you know, we're, as a bilateral donor, a lot of things will just go between the governments. But we're looking at how do we build the capacity, besides building the capacity of government to government, what's a new way to look at that angle? 
and to hold accountable both ourselves as donors and the governments that we're working with as recipients. And finally, in that piece of uh, you know, how we're moving forward, who are we not engaging through policy work and development work? Who's in the ground that we have not been talking to? And so all these are based on criticisms that we've all had, and I come from outside government, and having come inside government, the, spent most of my career being anti-development and pro-grassroots uh, development. So the idea of how can policymakers themselves within development shift the conversation, and it is happening. So I think one of the things we want to talk about with the impact investment especially, but how it relates to entrepreneurship, is how do these supply and demand sides translate into development speak? And how can we use the language of development to really understand impact investment? And I'll give you an example. We started a working group within our agency on impact investment and social entrepreneurship. Now you may think, you know, what's the big deal? It's a big deal in the sense that we're actually struggling with these conversations about what does it mean? And how does it impact our stove pipes, which are health, education, environment, et cetera? And so the conversation really is about what does impact investment mean for the person that's doing a program, managing a program in any of these areas, right? Again, it sounds like a simplistic conversation, but if you're talking about an agency for development, that can have ripple effects that are really very big. So even what impact investment means. So just these conversations about definitions are very critical to where we're, we're going internally. And I just want to throw out also in terms of South to South, one of the things that we're looking at from a policy perspective is what does that also mean? And what are the determinants of who is in that South to South conversation? And so this goes back to this idea that we are not necessarily going to be calling the shots as far as policy, and we shouldn't. So I, you know, just to convey that that's where these conversations are going. So having a new uh, also policy and approach to engagement is really critical. So looking at who's not at the table, who's not already in the conversations is giving us a sense that South to South may mean something very different from what we think from Washington perspective it should mean. So that's a really interesting conversation as well. And I think this idea of comparing and contrasting, for us at USAID, we work in 100 countries, right? And as you all know, we've been around for about 50 years and so on. And in its life cycle, it's not that old. But these learning curves are something that are very critical. And I think what we're also trying to do is, you know, we talked, uh, we've been talking all through the, the summit about how to support innovators and innovation and so on. What we're also trying to do is how do we mainstream innovation into policy itself? And how do you get policymakers to look innovatively at what they do? And that kind of mainstream is going to be very critical. And that's something that it's not so much as you would think a struggle as it is also the final point that I want to make about how this plays out is the tools that are available to policymakers. A lot of us like to think about how policymakers don't get it, they don't understand, and they're always in our way. Besides the fact that that's not always true and sometimes is true, it's also the tools that they don't have on hand on how to understand, like I said earlier, but also how to, to implement and how to create a, an ecosystem within policy and within government to make things happen. So I'm so excited to hear about Bihar's experience because I think that is a model of how, from the government perspective, you can bring innovation in and mainstream it through, but then also from that mainstreaming, come out with some really interesting ways to move forward in, from the development perspective. So I just wanted to throw that out into the mix. And finally, just as a cultural anthropologist, I'm very concerned about saying, how do these things just shift from one place to another without taking the cultural context into to, to mind? And so just saying that you know, an Indian model will work in X country or vice versa, we really, I, I would like us to think more strategically, whether we're from the investment side or from the implementation side, about the culture piece. And are we representing all the diversity of the Indian culture, which we know is amazing, in these conversations that we're having? And then, and then how are we helping, if we're going to create this global platform, how is that global platform also going to affect the conversations people have about culture moving forward in this space? I'll leave it at that. And, and can I ask you, uh, also as a social anthropologist, which makes you very qualified to answer this question, but um, what, I mean, when you look at all of these countries, if you, if you could pick one thing that people have most in common and one thing they have least in common, um, what would they be in yes. terms of impact investing? That, I mean, I think everybody was trying to avoid that question of how you compare things. And I think as an anthropologist, I'd have to say there's really, you can't pick one thing over another in terms of, and that, that's really the, the crux of what 
cultural studies is, is that it's so different, right? And it's so unique in and of itself. But we have come up with this idea of how do you look at entrepreneurship from the, from the entrepreneurship side, how do we see characteristics that are common, right? And those go across, and we have you know, folks here that come from the different contexts that can say, you know, I had the same experience as this. So for impact investments, uh, investors and then for development folks like ourselves, rather than saying what are the common denominators, we're asking what are the same questions we need to ask, right? What is the sort of approach that we need to take? And one of the things that we've looked at is instead of saying, uh, both for investors as well as for us as development practitioners, instead of saying and going to a community and saying, what's the problem? Flipping the script and saying, what's working? And again, for most of us in this room, that's such a basic concept. But for development practitioners, you have to understand how big a leap that is. You know, in terms of going in and, and asking what's working in a community, even in a slum area, what's working that is keeping people here has to be the common denominator everywhere we go so that we base the next step, which is what do they need, right? We want to solve a problem, but instead of creating the need in our own minds, what is the need, but besides the need, what's working that we can then build upon? It's a very simple uh, metric, and I feel like in terms of impact investment, it's the same kind of question. All of us want to do good. We want to throw either money or um, uh, resources or something at the problem. But the fact is, there are so many more things that are working that we are leaving behind or leaving aside that the energy is spent on the problem, which never really gets farther because of the other issues we have with it. So, I mean, in terms of how we look at, this is how I look at the cultural context, too, is how you look at the cultural context being an enabler and not something that gets in the way, which is a lot of times, you know, I go out and I do assessments on our programs on, are there cultural barriers to development? Is it culture that's keeping development from happening because so-and-so doesn't like such-and-such -and, -such and they don't like progress? And so for investors as well as for development practitioners, we really have to flip it and say, rather than is the culture a barrier, is the culture an enabler? And we heard about all the history from India, and the Indian context, but what is the social political identity looking like that's adding to the, the, the idea that entrepreneurship is something that's part of and comes from the tradition rather than something imposed? And if it just means we don't call it something, we call it something else, let's do that. And that makes it simplified, but it also creates a, a higher level conversation about the next steps. I don't know if that answered the question, but that's what I was thinking. It didn't really answer the question, but it was nonetheless interesting <laughs> um, on other, other, other issues. Now, um, we, we have some time for uh, questions from the audience. Um, there should be a, a roving microphone somewhere. Um, uh, and I wondered if anyone um, from the floor would, would like to ask a question for our panelists. Okay, the gentleman there in the check shirt. Hi, Mitra Arjun from Limited Networks. So, as Sorry, a, uh, can you put your hand up? I can't actually see where you are, I'm afraid. There, in the back. Okay. Hi, okay, why don't you go first and then we'll move to, to you in the front next. So, as an, as an early stage social venture, um, we're B2B, so we're working with partners in multiple countries. So, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, where can we use limited investment dollars to achieve the maximum both social and financial return? So. You know, the question that was just brought up about comparing c countries is very relevant because the question is, where can we do this best? And in particular, um, the regulatory framework is one of the main drivers of that. And I think it would be interesting to see more of a discussion of how can governments actually attract the models that are working well in other countries to their country by creating a, a regulatory framework that attracts companies rather than a regulatory framework that looks like it's mostly there to to block companies until they put enough money in the, in the pockets of the right politician. So, you know, we're, we're in energy and that's particularly prevalent in that sector. So I'm interested in that comment about how do we, how do we address those issues and how do we in fact make governments compete against each other to attract good models? Anyone from the, the panel like to respond to that? I mean, I guess we, I, I felt Florian touched on this in the most elegant way, which is that one way to to sort of judge which countries are most accessible is to look at the countries where businesses are, are prospering most. But I don't know if anyone would like to add um, to, to that. You know, I think uh, the question that's saying that investment capital is limited, I think we're already setting boundaries on ourselves. I mean, the moment we say this is limited and then we look at it as an allocation and efficiency issue. But I think that's not the case. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of capital which is available within the countries. 
Uh, the only question is how do you unlock it? Uh, and that's something we need some innovations on how do we unlock that capital. A very good example is the land we are sitting in right now. Uh, 1954, Vinoba Bhave, you know, he went 20 years in India and he asked people to give land. You know, so that because there are landless people in India and there are people with a lot of land in India. So he didn't ask governments outside. He didn't say that investment capital is limited, we can't do it. He went back to the people because ultimately people are the one who will give the capital for their own development. Two million hectares of land was donated in India for the landless. There is no other model in the world where such kind of investment has ever been generated. So we can talk a lot about investment, but look at the domestic investment and how do you unlock it? Sometimes it's so easy to write donor proposals and funding proposals that we don't want to spend 20 years traveling in India, you know, uh, trying to motivate people and unlock capital. So I think the I question think, investment is limited. I think it's, 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 it's very narrowing in a lot of way. I, I, to, to paraphrase the answer, maybe um, that, that we don't need you. Um, um, what's your experience? I mean, is there any evidence that governments are sort of competing in the same way they might for, for commercial investment? Well, I'd like to go back to the, to the question yeah. and maybe paraphrase the question, which I think is relevant for an organization to ask, where do you prioritize? Um, and and for, a, for, for a new uh, social impact fund coming through, it's, it's a fair question to ask. A question that we've asked ourselves, clearly, it should be where does your mission fit the needs? If one looks at poverty and it looks at the base of the pyramid, clearly India and Africa are the two regions where poverty is by far for the most. If one looks at India, look at the low-income states. More than a third of the world's poor are just in the low-income states of India. And then you keep on drilling down to where the problems are, and then look at how you can work with whatever you have as a resource to impact that. So I would gauge now for IFC, what are we doing in the low-income states going forward in terms of investment advisory, in terms of impact investment, and look at what we're doing in, in sub-Saharan Africa. More than I would look at, at LAC. And then look at where the, clearly you have to look at where the environment is more, where the private sector is more, and sometimes, despite the government, the private sector can make things happen. Okay, but it's a, you, you, the way you describe it is you first select where you think the problem is and then apply your filters of does the regulation work or not. Yes, and, and clearly, that's a secondary you step. can do that and you can give advice to the government how you can crowd in, and I think right. there is a space there uh, for, for having a platform which is a public-private uh, platform for taking some of these models across. And I think, you know, if I was to suggest, you know, why don't we have a Sankalp Africa, it was suggested earlier, why don't we have an IntelliCap in Africa that can bed down models that go across? Models, not entrepreneurs. Okay, good. I um, want to... Um, Sorry. Okay, very quickly, just because it would be good to fit in another question. Okay. So, um, okay. I just want to look at a little bit from a different angle, that uh, investment is really a mutual... Uh, relationship. So we investor also benefit a lot from interacting with the entrepreneur. And that aspect is not really selecting the, selecting the country, but really when you are investing, then from that you will, you will gain, you will learn. And that will create the new relationship between investor and investee. And that, that element should not be neglected. It should not be a one way that you will select a country and then you will invest. Yeah, you select an entrepreneur, not a, not a nation state. Um, the gentleman in the check shirt here, I think you, you were, that's working. Um, hello. Um, uh, innovations in the emergent OS programming methodology, uh, sorry, in innovations in the emergent OS programming methodology, practice allows multiple programmers to collaborate fork, modify, and remerge threads of code in distributed management and execution of open source projects. People like Tom Behetz and members of the EU Pir Pirate Party are developing these models for distributed policy development. Is this being considered in relations between the investment and government space? I suspect the answer is no. Mm. Um, but I don't know if anyone else... Okay. I, I, I'm afraid, I, th I think you've, you're talking about something that's important, but I, I doubt our panelists have thought about it deeply. Um, but thank you. Um, the, the lady there in the orange T-shirt. That's working. Okay. 
Um, sorry, going back to the topic then, I guess. Um, in what ways specifically can countries with more developed social enterprise ecosystems learn from the so-called up-and-coming countries uh, in the spirit of collaboration and dialogue rather than lecture? That's a, that's a good question. Nisha, you, you, you're someone who said India is ahead of the pack, but what could India learn from people who are behind it? Um, so yeah, India is ahead of the pack, but I think we have a lot to learn from other countries as well. Um, and I think Anil briefly touched upon it. Uh, for instance, you know, there are models that have worked really well in Africa, which we are kind of, you know, only beginning to scratch the surface here. Um, the whole revolution around mobile money, for instance, the way it has taken root in Africa. Um, you will be surprised to know that when we are working on a project in India, helping someone do exactly the same thing, and guess what are we doing? We are actually looking at what worked in Africa. We exactly do those things, right? I mean, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. I think poor, poor people are same, problems are same, solution sets often remain same. What really differ, differs is the cultural context and the delivery format change. You may have to change the mechanism in which you deliver a particular service. So I think in that sense, there is a lot of cross-learning that happens. Um, even in terms of, I think, just not just in uh, financial inclusion, um, even uh, going beyond you know, agricultural practices. We do actually learn a lot from Africa because it's way more evolved than we are in some sense, uh, especially when it comes to you know, how they deal with smallholder farmers. We haven't cracked the uh, model in India. So while I say that India is evolved, uh, I don't really even for a second believe that we have the perfect model. Um, and in that sense, I think uh, I agree with uh, Anil that we have to take the models and you know take them to another context and make them work there. What I don't believe is that don't reinvent the wheel. It's not necessary today. You know, a lot of trial and error has happened. So let's just learn in that sense. And I don't think it's just an academic discussion. In fact, uh, as practitioner, um, as a practitioner who works in projects in Africa and in India, we do this very often. We uh, see, you know, what's worked in another context. How can it make it? How can I, you know, make it work here? We often collaborate, even in terms of, you know, bringing experts over. So um, to me, it's not just an academic discussion, honestly. Okay, do we have another question? Yeah. Um, we're going to do first the gentleman in the white shirt and after him the lady there. But if you could go first. So, sorry. Hi, is it working? Apologies. Yeah, would you mind? Uh, I've just been uh, helpfully reminded. Would, could, could you introduce yourself as well? Uh, Ajit Jangiani. I live in Boston and Bombay. I'm in the field of social enterprise Vikas. Your positive energy for India is exemplary. I really like what you say. We created the zero agree, but Gandhi also tried to teach us cleanliness and working with Adivasis. We didn't learn very well. So for each point you make, I can make a counterpoint. We are also very knowledgeable, wise people. In fact, anything you tell an Indian, I say, Patai, I know. So we know everything. There's <laughs> nothing much we can know, right? Do now is different. Now in doing, we do need all stakeholders to sit at the table. Is it possible for Indians to get together? Because I haven't seen it. Yes, yesterday I was talking to an expert on, on microfinance. They said there were three big guys. They knew what the cracks were. They still couldn't get together. The government is needed for anything to go to scale. But try and get the government to sit down. Is it possible? Question one, question two, south to south. Kenya got M-Pesa, from it came Equity Bank. If you talk to John, I forget his name of Equity Bank, he said, what's the big deal? You withdraw, borrow, uh, deposit, withdraw, or take the loan, I don't need buildings. I said, why don't you expand it? He said, not a week goes by when a central gov governor of a bank doesn't come and talk to me. Not one person has adopted it. So if we're not willing to listen, we're not willing to see, like the lady from IntelliCap said, you don't need to reinvent. We do want to establish partnerships, which we can't. How, how, what's the magic glue that gets us through this? Okay, so because I think the, the question is, is you know, India is notorious for its lousy government, notwithstanding um, Bihar. Um, how, how does that affect things? I mean, it, it's clearly the case that you know, India has a, you know, a problem with red tape, for example. I think. Things are changing. I am very optimistic. The reason I'm optimistic are twofold. One is I'm seeing that the younger generation is not, is very different from the older generation. You know, there was a lot of respect of politics, you know. I mean, in India, there was a 
political leader who was at the top and there were villagers sitting there bowing their heads in front of the politics. Now I think there is an irreverent culture, which is a very good because it's chaotic. The same information technology which we are exporting to the world, the, the day it starts looking at our own systems, own governance systems, I think we are going to see a lot of change. Madam has already mentioned about right to information. You know, every day we are seeing more and more right to information coming in. That is going to reduce the red tapeism. The other thing which I think is happening really well is there are internal forces. You know, people are getting together more and more, demanding rights. And I think there's an empowerment and there's more awareness that even yesterday someone said that I don't want to offer something free. I want them to pay something so that restore the consumer dignity that I'm paying for it so I can demand answers from you. So I think the model is shifting and I'm, I think that is going to change the red tapeism. If, if governments don't perform, then probably we don't need government, then we reinvent government. And that's something which I will ask IntelliCap to look at into is that forget dot coms. The next step is dot gov, how we can, you know, uh, put governance and put enterprises in the governments. Nisha, do you feel ready yeah. to reform I, India's government? I think that's actually a real concern. Um, although I agree with regards that uh, the market, you know, the government is opening up. But I truly believe that to create an effective information corridor, you don't necessarily need government. I mean, not that their participation is not desirable, but it's, a, it's not a necessary condition in my opinion. I think the market forces can take over. And uh, you know, wherever there, are, there is necessity for people to exchange information, to exchange ideas, to exchange business models, markets are going to take over at some point, and then I believe that government will respond to it. So I don't see it actually as a necessary condition. Okay, thank you. Um, the lady, Excuse me. Oh, can I, ask? I? Sorry, this lady was before you. I think there was a there was a lady here. Thank you. Could we get the microphone? Uh, hi. Um, I, well, I have a question um, um, regarding... Could you, could you introduce yourself as well? Oh, yeah, of course. My, my name is Pooja, and I'm a cultural anthropologist. I've been brought up in the first world, so to speak. So, um, I would like to know how was the collaboration um, and the cooperation between Asian countries and African countries and the private sector. I mean, the Sankalp Forum is like one example of a forum where everybody comes together. But other, other forums, other, um, yeah, other places where actually people from the south come together, meet together, and, and discuss about social issues and also um, investment and all these things. Thank you. That's a very practical question. Where, what are other places where people can go to, to pursue this? Quite a few, actually. Um, the, uh, the chambers of commerce do this, in fact. Uh, just a few days ago, in fact, uh, there's something in Delhi, which is again Indo-Africa Investment Summit. Exim Bank does these, um, th these meets also. Um, my sense is we tend to do them far too many in India. I would, I, I think, you know, uh, I would like to see this much more happening in, in, in Africa, for example, if one is talking about Indo-Africa. I think there's a space for that to happen. Um, and in terms of models, if somebody asked a question, and there's a monitor study that was done some years ago about uh, uh, transfer of models between India and Africa, if you want to know, know more about this inclusive business model space. So, but, but there is a lot happening in this space. It isn't realizing much results as yet. Uh, one suggestion is let's get out into Africa and to other countries much more rather than get them here. Well, on that note, we're going to ha have to wrap up. Um, I, our job here was to try and see um, what the similarities and differences were between various regions. Um, uh, I, I think one of the things we've learned is that it's, it's quite difficult to say what they are. Um, but nonetheless, the, the panel has helped us understand um, the priorities of people from different bits of the world. And I'm very grateful to them. And also thank you to you, the audience. Thank you, Mr. Follis, uh, for your excellent moderation. A huge round of applause for him, please. Wow. Uh, I request the dignitaries on the panel to remain on stage, and including Mr. Follis. Uh, Mr. Follis, I request you to give a token of appreciation to all the dignitaries who are with us on the panel discussion, please. <laughs> See, we always have the goodie bags, don't we? <laughs> Thank you.
A round of applause for all the people who are asking questions in the audience as well. Very introspective, great insight, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fellas, we're also going to make sure you get a goodie bag from us as well. We request the organizers to give Mr. Fellas a moment of appreciation as well. Thank you. Thank you to each one of us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, for a Next announcement. For this, I would like to invite on stage Mr. Vinny Tarai, Chairman IntelliCap, uh, to tell us about the launch of the Indian Impact Investors Council. Vinny Tarai, if you're here, can we have you on board, please? All yours? I know I actually, uh, it looks like I multiplied on the way, but uh, that's what happened. So my announcement is actually uh, about a fairly important uh, step that we as a collective uh, have taken, which is uh, announcement of setting up an Indian Impact Investor Council. Uh, this is a council which would actually be talking about how the impact investors will self-regulate them. Uh, the founding members include, every founding member is on the stage right now, we different, different, different funds, we have different uh, expectations, etc. But what we are trying to do is come up with a common minimum pro <coughs> prog program that would allow us to do things uh, which will not only make us responsible, but uh, make sure that the sector actually has better recognition over a period of time. Uh, I would not like to go through the list of the names. Uh, we are going to make a proper press release down the line. Uh, but this actually has come through with the a uh, lot of effort put in by a lot of people, and uh, each person out here has contributed in the visioning of this self-regulatory organization. Uh, for us, it, I think, is a very important and a large step uh, forward. I think Sankal Forum has actually played a fairly important role in giving us an opportunity to speak from here. So thank you, everybody. But uh, I think in the history of impact investing, for us, it's actually a very important announcement, and we hope to actually be able to come back next year to tell you how far we have gone from where we started today. Thank you.